Welcome to this week's episode of SpaceX in the News, your number one place for your latest SpaceX Intel drops. Just ignore who said that, it doesn't matter, just know that it's almost a fact. All right, my name's Kevin. Today we're checking in with Starship now that Hurricane Dorian has passed through. We'll take a look at Starship's proposed landing sites on Mars, get knee deep in some satellite drama between ESA and SpaceX. Then we'll discuss some exciting new information concerning Starlink, and we'll finish with today's honorable mention. Let's get started. This week, Hurricane Dorian was posed to make landfall at Florida's Cape, where SpaceX is currently building its Mark II Starship. At one point, the storm was upgraded to a Category 5, but started to change its behavior once it reached the northern Bahama Islands. At first, it just kind of stayed in one place, then it started to shift north, and pretty much just passed right by Florida's coast, and it's currently making its way up the eastern seaboard. So despite a couple days of delays, Starship has been spared, and as you can see, the workers are back in the yard doing their thing and the lower half of Starship was pulled back out of the hangar. Meanwhile, the development of the Mark I Starship in Boca Chica, Texas hasn't slowed down at all. Just the other day, Lab Padre captured one of the last, if not the last, hull ring being installed on top of the rocket structure, and Boca Chica Maria sent an image of Starship's new guts coming in via caravan. Furthermore, Lab Padre managed to capture aerial footage of some of the bulkheads hidden away behind the shipping containers, as well as what appears to be Starship's fin or canard. But wouldn't you know it, as I'm recording this, Maria sends me a lot more photos of the site and all the progress that SpaceX is doing right now. They started putting skin onto Starship's windbreaker. More trucks are coming on site. They're still digging. Those crates that were on the convoy of trucks are now offloaded. And now we have new assembly jigs set up on those three assembly sites. The unrelenting pace of progress here just astounds me. Elon said that the Mark I Starship would be fully built come his Starship presentation on the 28th. And it seems to me they are more than determined to meet that deadline. If you're like me and you just can't get enough Starship information, I recommend you check out the recent Business Insider article that reveals the recently released updates to SpaceX's plans for the Boca Chica site. Most of it's not new information, but it does talk about Starship's phases a little bit. I'll put a link in the description. It came to light this week that SpaceX is getting out in front of its mission to colonize Mars when newly released images showed proposed Starship landing sites. Located in the Arcadia Planitia site, in proximity to the solar system's largest volcano, Olympus Mons, the sites are located on an expansive plane based below the mean surface level. Apparently, SpaceX has been researching sites for more than two and a half years and are fond of these sites for several reasons. First, these boring planes are void of most landing obstacles like craters and boulders. Second, the atmospheric pressure will be greater at these low altitudes, allowing for more efficient landings and better weather. And last, but most importantly, tis a place with an abundance of water ice ice that SpaceX will need to process for Starship's propellant. Are you guys feeling that adrenaline rush of excitement right now? I know I am. Makes me want to play some Kerbal. Now it's time to get dramatic. So follow closely here because this story is a little bit odd. Let's begin the space drama. This week, ESA, or the European Space Agency, tweeted out a passive aggressive tweet, <laughs> throwing an unnamed satellite company under the bus, or crawler, whatever writing that for the first time ever, ESA has performed a collision avoidance maneuver to protect one of its satellites from colliding with the Mega Constellation. In case you're not a good guesser, they were referring to SpaceX's Starlink Constellation satellites. So ESA soon followed up with a series of tweets that basically described how they fired the thrusters on their satellite to avoid a potential collision with SpaceX. And what I found particularly funny is that Matt Desch, who you may recognize from SpaceX's Iridium launches, called out ESA by tweeting, hmm. We move our satellites on average once a week and don't put out a press release to say who we maneuvered around. Dash is a loyal and former customer of SpaceX who has publicly spoken out in the company's defense in the past. But this is where the story gets interesting. When you could say ESA leaked insider information to a media source, Jonathan O'Callaghan, and Jonathan relayed ESA's messages that wrote of how SpaceX refused to move their Starlink satellite. One of his tweets read that ESA had been pretty frustrated with SpaceX so far. There has been very little communication regarding Starlink, despite repeated attempts by ESA to contact them. These tweets seem to have caused SpaceX to do some damage control by clarifying their side of the situation, writing to their own source, Lauren Grush, that SpaceX did exchange emails when the probability of collision was only 1 in 50,000. But at that time, both SpaceX and ESA determined that those odds did not call for any evasive maneuvering. Then updates from the U.S. Air Force showed that the probability increased to 1 in 10,000. But a bug in SpaceX's on-call paging system prevented the Starlink operator from seeing follow-on correspondence on this probability increase. Had SpaceX seen the correspondence, they would have coordinated with ESA. The Starlink satellites do have an automatic avoidance maneuver mode that has been reported to have performed 16 times before. And the satellite that ESA was worried about is fully operational and was undergoing a deorbit maneuver. 
60 of these constellation prototypes were put into orbit a few months ago, 50 of which have reached their intended orbit and are functioning as intended, five have paused their orbit raising, three have been declared dead, and two are lowering their orbits to simulate their end of life. And while we're on the topic of Starlink, let's talk about the future. SpaceX is no longer planning on doing two more Starlink missions for the rest of 2019. Now it's possibly four more. These missions are currently scheduled for dates as early as October 10th, October 25th, November 13th, and December 8th. SpaceX simultaneously requested that the FCC modify its current Starlink application to permit a slight change in orbital characteristics that would drastically improve the broadband satellite constellation's coverage in its early stages. Until recently, Starlink was posed to begin providing services to northern U.S. and southern Canadian regions after only six launches or 360 satellites and limited global coverage around 24 launches or 1,440 satellites in orbit. But now, per an FCC license modification request published on August 30th, SpaceX believes it can dramatically expedite coverage just by adjusting their satellite's orbital planes, essentially creating more lanes by deploying Starlink sats to three separate planes during each launch. According to SpaceX, this would cut the number of launches needed for equivalent coverage in half. It's funny how quickly things can change when you're dealing with cutting edge technology, eh? All right, it's time for today's honorable mention. All right, so I decided it's time to do a short little diddly on Space Force. Now I know this subject comes with a lot of political strings attached, so what I'm gonna do for you is something that the mainstream media gave up on long ago, report objectively. Okay. So the first thing we have to establish is what is Space Force? Well, Space Force is a newly proposed branch of the United States Armed Forces. So just like we have a Navy, Army, Air Force, and Marines, soon we may also have a Space Force. Yes, we have a Coast Guard too, but they fall under the Department of Homeland Security, except during times of war. And similar to how the Marines fall under the Department of the Navy, Space Force will fall under the Department of the Air Force. It will be led by the U.S. Space Command, which until recently was a subordinate of the Air Force. That's right, it already existed and has existed uninterrupted since 2002. Space Command's role would be to protect American military and commercial satellites and spacecraft from foreign attack which includes hacking. And the Space Force it commands would be responsible for recruiting, buying or building equipment and weapons, and training people to operate and use them. So no, they won't be recruiting and training stormtroopers, unfortunately. A common argument made by the supporters for the formation of Space Force is that the modern American society relies heavily on satellites for everything from GPS to banking systems to cellular service and a number of crucial military processes. The risk of these systems being compromised represents a significant national security threat while potential adversaries such as Russia and China are developing counter space capabilities and anti-satellite weapons that could interfere with US space systems in a future conflict by interfering with signals or destroying satellites. Now the opposite coin of that argument, and one made by the dissenters of Space Force, is that space should be a place for cooperation and innovation and that basing US space operations within the military would make conflict more likely. Furthermore, that moving Space Command from the Air Force will just create more bureaucracy. To which its supporters counter that space is too big of an operation and thus the Air Force isn't capable of innovating fast enough. These are obviously not all the arguments for or against the conception of Space Force. But if you don't already have your own opinion formed and you really care about what you believe, then you'll do the rest of the research yourself. Because quite frankly, it's the end of the show and I'm tired of talking about this. But before I go, I just want to make you aware, if you're not already, that we now have an official website for the channel at spaceeccentric.com. Here you can access my blog, where I'm keeping up on the latest development intel for Kerbal Space Program 2. Or stop by my store and check out all the fresh swag. Swag! Thank you so much for tuning in, and until the next time, Godspeed. These SpaceX in the News episodes are made possible by the generous donations of my Patreon members. And if you'd like to see even more space eccentric content, consider becoming a Patreon yourself. Even a dollar a month will get you access to exclusive videos not available here on YouTube. There's a link in the description. And God bless my friend.